Good afternoon, the Wayzata of Public Schools board meeting work session for Monday, March 28, 2022 will come to order and we will go around the table for introductions. Linda Cohen. Cheryl Holzman. Dana Miller. Heidi Cater. Jay Hesby. Dee Dee Carey. Wendy O'Leary. Nathan Blanford. Chase Anderson. And I'm Sarah Johansson. We are all here and accounted for. Um, we have a couple of um, items on our agenda for this evening. And the first um, two items will be related to finance and operations reports. And the first is a presentation regarding Wysetta Cafes and the National School Lunch Program. So I'll hand it over to Dee. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the board, Superintendent Anderson. Um, so we have a presentation tonight. I'm going to call forward uh, Michelle Sagedahl. Uh, Michelle is the director of Wyveta Cafes, and um, we'll be doing, going through the presentation tonight. This presentation was brought forward um, to uh, SLT. It was brought forward to the Finance Committee of the Board. It was also brought forward to CFAC as well. So we've had a number of conversations about it, and um, I'm going to run this over to Michelle so she can run the slide. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. And as Dee said, I am Michelle Sayle, director of Wyzetta Cafes, and today we'll be reviewing um, our National School Lunch Program for Wyzetta High School. Currently, where we're at, um, the high school and off NSLP, when I say NSLP, I'm referring to the National School Lunch Program. Um, in the 14-15 school year. That was due to portion sizes and the caloric restrictions that were in place at that time. Um, on the horizon, all the current restrictions were coming down the pipeline, known as smart snack. And at that time, it was to be a two-year pilot program. Fast forward to March of 2020, uh, universal meal waivers were implemented due to COVID. Since then, Wyzetta the High School has participated in all of those waivers in order to provide universal meals for our students. Before um, we get too much further ahead, um, during COVID, there was a, an additional benefit introduced for our students on free and reduced lunch, known as pandemic electronic benefits transfer. What that was, was uh, additional benefits that was given on like a, a card, very similar to food stamps in our food support program. Our high school students were not able to receive those benefits from March 2020 to August 2021 because we did not participate on NSLP prior to COVID. So just a, a caveat of what occurred because of not participating on NSLP. Um, currently, because of COVID, just like everywhere else right now, we are facing a budget deficit that was um, fast forwarded due to COVID. Uh, our um, fund balance was completely um, wiped because of everything. So that brings us to what are our next steps. Going ahead, thinking kind of of two scenarios. Scenario one, universal meals has been uh, brought forward on the federal and state level. Um, however, it is not looking promising on either fronts. So it was taken out of the federal level supplemental budget. Um, and Governor Walz does have it in his um, budget package. Also, so what we're being told right now is neither of those are promising at this moment. So we will be moving forward with scenario number two, which is we are going to start anticipating that we will return to paid meals or meal prices based on student eligibility, which is free, reduced, or paid. So that brings us to our high school. So some bullet points to consider if we join the National School Lunch Program for the high school. The meal patterns for 22 through 24 are 80% of grains must be whole grain rich. We are actually pretty much at that percentage level currently at the high school. Students must take that half cup fruit or vegetable. Um, something to keep in mind is our students currently at the high school have grown up with the National School Lunch Program, and they are used to taking that fruit or vegetable. So we see many of our students at the high school taking it without being prompted. The caloric maximums, which were a huge concern when the meal patterns first came out, those have been lifted. So we no longer have a maximum that we cannot go over. 
USDA does expect to publish their updated Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act meal patterns this fall of 22. They would not take place until the 24-25 school year. We would have to follow all of our regulations. Again, smart snacks. Where this is impacted are our vending machines at the high school. Currently, they have vending machines, I believe, on every floor. They have them behind our a la carte room. So those would all either need to be smart snack approved or turned off during the school day. Any fundraisers that might happen during the school day would need to follow smart snacks. I do not have a good knowledge of what they might do during the school day, but if like student council says that we're going to sell donuts for a fundraiser for a student council, that would technically not be allowed because it's not smart snack. And then something to keep in mind are entree exemptions. So going back to the 14-15 school year when the high school went off the program, a concern was that we wouldn't be able to sell peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for additional supplements for students to grab for after school. That is no longer a concern. So there's um, creative menu planning and entree exemptions that will still allow us a nice variety to provide an a la carte. We will see a little bit of decreased a la carte sales because we would wrap our meals into reimbursable meals or meal bundles. So we might see an increase in lunch counts and a little bit decrease in a la carte sales. And then any additional federal or state support we may receive, I am guessing, and my gut tells me and we've seen it, is going to be tied on tied to whether or not we participate in NSLP. So an example I brought up was PEBT for our students. And then additionally, we received what was known as supply chain assistant funds. We are receiving about $200,000. That was based on whether your program participated in NSLP this last year, or seamless summer option is what we did participate on, just a different, little different variation, um, but it was then based on enrollment. So had we not participated at the high school this last school year, we would have received only about two thirds of that $200,000. Just to give you guys a quick glimpse of some meals that we are currently offering, um, this just shows a nice variety of the fruits and vegetables and portion. Um, current portion sizes that we are serving at the high school. And this was actually taken by a high school teacher. He eats with us regularly and then he has an Instagram account and he posts them. So I grabbed a few of these from him. So uh, I, will, I actually have to figure out his, uh, his name and exactly who it is. He does not need a thank you for these beautiful pictures. Um, if the high school does stay on NSLP, uh, we are facing budget concerns. Leading up to COVID, we were operating in a deficit. Um, so what we're looking at is really capturing our federal, federal and state reimbursement in commodity dollars, which is about $375,425,000 that we do need to start looking at to capture. Um, if we do continue to stay off, we would need to significantly increase our prices again. That includes meal prices and a la carte. Um, if you look at just other retail chains or restaurants that you can go to, we would need to start working towards those prices in order to stay um, in a positive operating budget. And then um, we have community feedback to consider of pros and cons of staying on the program, going off the program, but the biggest concern is our budget and operating deficit. One more area to tie in and bring up for discussion is our online meal payment fees. Currently, we do play a $1.95 flat fee for each transaction. So when a family deposits money, um, we are absorbing a $1.95 flat fee. A flat fee versus a percentage was more advantageous to us prior to COVID because of the volume that we were seeing. Now we're not seeing that volume because meals are not, or meals are free. So it's really all the cart money that's going in. So we would need to consider um, whether we continue with a flat fee or a percentage. Um, but we do absorb approximately $230,000 a year in credit card fees. Uh, just quickly looking at what other surrounding districts um, do for their credit card fees. Orono, Eastern Harbor County, and West Tonka, their families do pay credit card fees. Um, Hopkins, ISD 196, Anoka Hennepin, and Mountains View. Food service does continue to absorb in Prairie, the fee is split. 
And then um, I did not hear back from Minnetonka and Osceola Maple Grove. Going back up, West Tonka does pay the credit card fee prior to the start of school year to encourage um, deposits. And then in September, their families start to absorb that fee for the school year. So what we would like to recommend tonight and bring up for discussion is the high school will continue to participate in the National School Lunch Program. And when I say continue, is we have essentially been following those meal patterns this last school year. So we are currently, except for supply chains here and there, um, and I say here and there, it's pretty much every day, but um, they, to our best of our ability right now, we are following the National School Lunch Program regulations. And then we would like to discuss the proposal that families pay the credit card fees. Okay, well, thank you, Michelle. Just one minute. Any wrap up questions? Any wrap up comments from you, Dee, before I go to well, I appreciate it. I, I've heard Michelle's presentation several times, and she always introduces something that I think was really important to register, and that is that we have been on the National School Lunch Program for this past year, and it's gone well um, at the high school. Um, also, as Michelle said, three fourths of our kids next year will have. Been accustomed to it, so it won't be much of a change to them. Um, and then the vending machines, um, that will be probably one area that we'll need to work with um, Scott Engler to make that, that adjustment as well. Um, $425,000 additional revenue, that's a big deal to, to Michelle's budget. It's, it's a pretty big deal to make sure we have that. So um, I think it's the prudent thing to do. Um, I also appreciate the lunches that she, she suggests up there that the um, is it my school lunch? I think is what the, yeah. the hashtag is or something to that nature. Yeah. He does a great job. So, um, and then just to let you know that CFAC and the finance committee of the board have both reviewed the, the fees for the, the credit card and both approve, recommend moving forward with families paying that. And I did talk to Michelle a little bit about um, concerns for families that might um, limited on resources and, and she did indicate that a lot of those families do be in cash if it's cash there's no or credit or chip card or check excuse me um there's no fee for that it's just the credit card piece of it where there is a fee um also i think if you're not paying any fee we may be seeing smaller payments more frequent payments from just the general public which does take more time and energy and so those might go down and, and actually be more efficient in the operations as well. So I support what um, Michelle brought forward and, and recommend moving forward with those two options. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, we know we have some board questions and comments, starting with Jay. Yeah, one question that I, so, and I apologize if I didn't get this in the other in, in, uh, exposures. So the, the, the credit card fees, is that sort of on top of the 425? Oh, oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I mean, assuming we go forward kind of with the recommended action, it's we'll avoid the 425 deficit. Yes. And on top of that, we'll recoup the credit card fee another quarter, 230. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Um, uh, um maybe you mentioned this in the other uh, meetings also, but uh two questions. Is there a possibility for families to pay with an EFD with a kind of fund transfer directly to our account. Mm -hmm. So in that case, there is no fee. To yes. Okay. And the other one is this year, we have the free lunch program, free meals from the federal government. So there are no credit card transactions for those. Correct, with the free meals. Yep. Families are currently just depositing money for all the card or second uh, entries. Yes. But yes. Is, is there a fee for that? No, we are currently absorbing that okay. in the O2, correct. Yes, thank you. But with that, that would change okay. any any credit card payment. Sure. Right. Yes. If I can just, I'll get to more questions. If I can add a historical comment. I remember sitting on CFAC in 2019 talking about these credit card fees. And I think there was some discussion and, um, and a move from the CFAC to, to have the family start paying them then. And then we were transferring over to Titan and then the pandemic happened. And so it was all there. So there's a few different CFACs that have had these conversations that have been in back and paused. Other comments or questions? Heidi, good question. So I have anecdotal experience um, that kids are, students are more willing to eat fruits and veggies. And I know that some people have had a 
concern with you know the fruits and veggies getting wasted. What's your experience from culinary's perspective? Are, are students really eating more veggies and fruits and produce these days? Yeah, yes, is the okay. simple answer. Um, they really are. We, when Healthy Under Free Kids um, Kid Act first came out, it was a constant battle of confrontation. Um, now you see students grabbing those fruits and vegetables. You still have the one at the, you know once in a while where we have to send a student back or encourage them to take something. Um, and then that's where share tables come in handy. Um, again, those have been put on pause because of COVID, um, but we'll start to see those coming back where they truly don't want to eat it. Instead of going in the trash, they can put it on a share table and someone can either grab it or we can even take it back into operation after cleaning and washing it again. And that goes for cheese sticks, smelled, not just fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Quick question. In the beginning, you mentioned scenario one, scenario mm -hmm. two. Yes. Scenario one, universal meals, and what is that? Is that really just not an option? Um, so, universal meals is right, that's what we currently have right now due to the waivers because of COVID. Um, it was put in the omnibus um, the, on the, on the, on the, on the bill um, to potentially extend those waivers for free meals on the federal level, um, but they pulled that out. So. Um, so it's I, for all students. Yes. All, okay. all students, regardless of their financial capabilities. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And I think that's the player. Right that's the yeah, yeah, universal yeah. means. Yeah. Everyone is getting it. Okay. okay. So, yeah. Free. And right. participation's been up, just been great. Yeah. But, they, but that's no longer for you. They've taken it out. I do know there is a bill in a group now that I just found out about today that are trying to reintroduce it on the federal level, um, which I know Klobuchar is in support of it and part of that group. Um, but I don't know how far that will go. Walls had it in his um, supplemental budget proposal, um, but from our legislative for School Nutrition Association for Minnesota, that's not looking extremely promising either right now. So oh, I have one question. Um, there's guidelines, obviously, right, within the realm, of, but it, does the district have flexibility to just what you need to meet our kids' needs, like our community may be different than you know, actually, yes. Okay, um, a lot of that has been again COVID and supply chain okay. driven right now. Um, so again, hopefully, we start to see that normalcy of where we get really get to dictate our buying and what we do buy. Um, right now, we like, don't have as much power because it's just more what can we get versus what do we want. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> Your questions or comments. I, I was on a discredit card fee that you many years ago, a few years ago, retailers for example, vendors could not pass the child on to customers. Mm -hmm. And we recently, two, three years ago, the Supreme Court decided that. that Um, I just have one comment, and I've said this before, and, and I'll say it again, and stakeholders, this is probably maybe a communications thing, but um, again, my anecdotal, right, if I put on my parent head a little bit, knowing um, lots of parents who might put smaller amounts on a credit card in their lunch accounts because they don't want their child to go spend you know, lots of money on a la carte, and so you sort of limit that bank. It'll be helpful to do some kind of start of the year communications or something to let families know and do some of that encouraging of if you're gonna do from a credit card, do a, a larger lump sum um, so that you're not getting that on a regular basis. So, um, but I know that we always have really great communications for families at the start of the year. And that's a question, I guess, for you. I guess I have a process question, maybe for DD or Chase or something, a couple of them. One, if we start to do some of these things like around the credit card fees, um, would that be effective at the start of the new school year? Or would that be something that we would want to put into effect immediately? Start of the new school yeah, year. I think a plan is the start of the new year. We work with Amy's department to help roll out a good communications from the why is it a cafe spot that? Okay. And then second of all, this switch to the National School Lunch Program and all of this, will this then be something, do we need to, does the board need to vote on this in any way? So will it come to our April meeting or is that something that we, we, we do plan to bring into the April 11th meeting It'll just be under the consent agenda because you've heard this, some of you more than once, and that we're really just affirming where we are at today, right? Because we're on the National School Lunch Program this year. So we're reaffirming it 
to continue that um, going forward. Okay. And I do remember having some um, presentations at the board level over this past year when we were going on to the seamless summer options and other things. And so board colleagues, both um, from last year's board and this year's board are aware that this has happened. So, okay, final questions or comments? I think the only other thing is to comment on is the communication. Mm -hmm. um, we'll just need to do an even bigger push around free and reduced applications too. Um, so that tied into credit card periods and everything, we'll just really have to make sure our families know of everything because we'll want to get those applications captured. Our percentage is down because of our free meals this year. And is your trade group also, I'm sorry, I keep adding, is your trade, I know that maybe some school boards associations and other places are really looking at those applications and, and finding ways because those applications affect other things in terms of compensatory dollars and other things. And so is your trade group also working, I mean, is this a kind of a collective drumbeat from all of us? Yeah, it really sort of it comes, I think, from our department and then really though getting that message out there. Amy and I work really close, but we'll just need to do a little bit more of this year with um, getting the communication out. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. I won't add any more. Thank you for joining us. And uh, thanks for all that you do for feeding our kiddos. Okay, and, and we have one more item on uh, finance and operations reports, and, and that's some general budget updates. I'll let Dee start it off with that too. Certainly. So, um, as the board knows, we've been working on our budget. You've seen a couple of presentations related to that. I think the last couple of work sessions, um, we are have proposed to the school board a five point two million dollar cost containment to allow us to stay um, within our budget planning that does include a use of about $2 million in fund balance based on the assumptions that we provided to you and to the, the board finance committee as well. So um, just know that we're here to answer any questions you might have. Superintendent Anderson might have some additional comments and I can we can both respond to any questions you might have. Great, thank you. I don't think I really have any comments uh, beyond that other than it's been a week since we uh, had a special work session to speak to you about those cost containment uh, information items and just thought that it would be an opportunity since we were convenient to put that back on the agenda today and to see if there's any other follow-up questions or uh, insights that anybody may want to share. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you. And if there are none, that's fine. If there are, then we'll do our best to respond to those. Thank you. Board colleagues, any additional questions or comments? I have one question. Sure. Um, so the, obviously, you know, nobody wants to be you know, going through what we're going through. And I know it's really tough um, for the district, for the community, for the teachers, for it's, it's tough. Um, but I, it's part of COVID recovery and we're just gonna try through. Um, here's my question though, is that is as we move forward, what mechanisms, because I know the district has a lot of mechanisms that are in place to continually assess and reassess decisions that get made. And I'm just wondering if you can speak to that a little bit. So sure. for sure. the, you know, the decisions that, yep. so yep. in a couple of years, how do we assess how it's going? Right. So I think the first thing that needs to happen or will happen is when we start in the fall, we'll be looking at our enrollment and where we're at. Did we, first of all, did we meet the enrollment projection we had and are we exceeding that? From that, then we start to do kind of a preliminary budget and start looking at that again. And certainly we, we did have some other ideas that were brought forward. We also have some review of all of our programs again to, to verify, are we staffed in the right manner? Are there any other efficiencies that we can do? Are there things that we can um, mitigate some costs in? to help make things uh, better as it goes forward in the future. So, um, you know, I know there's always a question about there's $9.2 billion sitting out there. You know, couldn't we use some of that? We have no guarantee that we're getting any of that money. And even if we do, you've heard me say before, I would strongly encourage the board to consider letting that stay within our fund balance to offset future 
expenses that are that are coming up. So just to give you an idea of where our fund balance has been at, um, and I know I'm throwing up numbers. In 2019, it was at 9%. 2020, it went up to 12.1%. Then it dropped down in 21 to 8.8%. That's the year we used about 4.8 million of fund balance to offset that influx of expenses with the students going down that we talked about. Current year, we're about flat at 8.3. That next year, even with the budget reductions and use of 2 million, we'll be at 6.8%. The following year is where it starts to really drop down to 2.9%. And then the following year after that, then it would be down, that is year. That's, that's revenue year, 2025. That's even with the mitigation. So that's right. even with the mitigation. Yeah. So that's why I caution you yep. to make sure that we consider that. We will continue to monitor. We will make sure um, as an administrative team, we're not gonna let that fund balance go negative. We know what the board's goal is, the five to 7% and really wanting it in essence as 7% because you want us to have a plan to come out of that. So all of that is the work that we'll do as um, you know, executive directors, SLT, leadership council, all will be working on as to how we can make sure that Wyzetta Schools has the financial uh, situation where we can continue to educate our kids, yet stay at the fund balances that the board has directed to us. Does that help? Maybe? It does. Okay. Yes. And I think part of my question too is, you know, as we're making shifts to um, programs and things like that, there's a constant, you know, review and assessment and mm -hmm. Of, of how things are going at a curriculum level, how things are going into schools, that, that's something that is built into our systems and processes already. Um, that's right. right. And we, we, had, we did have conversations about that at, um, at SLT. How are we going to look? We're doing the middle school review right now. How does that look? How does that affect anything with the budget? We certainly will look at elementary, we'll look at the high school, we'll look at any other program and say, where are we at? How does it work? Is this, is this leading up to where we want to provide the best education we can, but are there any operational costs that we can do some savings on? Cheryl, just a quick sort of side question. How much does that affect our AAA bond rating when we go out and get assessed? I mean, our fund balance, keeping it within the parameters, is that, do they look at that a lot or just a little? Yes, they certainly look at our fund balance as one of the options, one of the um, markers for where our triple bond rating is at. They also look at um, what level of support do we have from our community and our operating referenda is at the highest, it's at the cap, right? And that is a big, big um, factor in it because we're not always reliant on um, as much state aid. So most school districts, I would say around that 70 to 75% on state aid, I think ours is closer to 60% on state aid. So they recognize that as being a plus because the state cannot, they can sometimes not appropriate funds to the community, whereas the operating referenda does provide that ongoing support until it has to be renewed, but we've had very good success right here. So um, those two factors, management of it, having a plan, that those are all factors in looking at credit rating. And quite frankly, the, the, the community and the, um, the affluency of the community is also a factor in it too. So it's not just the school districts, it's also the community support as well. And Didi, would you, I would think sometimes those two work connected with each other. So the AAA bond rating looks at our operating referenda and our community support, right? And then our community looks at our AAA bond rating and the fact that the district does work to tighten their belt and do other things to say, we know the district spends our money wisely, right. we will trust you. And so it feels like this symbiotic relationship where, you know, we're working to um, gain trust and respect from both sides. Yeah. A virtuous circle. A virtuous <laughs> circle is what Mr. Hesby tells us. Yes. Was that a second question too, or just a? No, yeah, I did one question. So too, as we look beyond the 2223 and into those future where, you know, there's really conservative assumptions on the growth in the formula and presumably, you know, we're going to see the formula rate go up and 
reflect some inflationary factors, but as of now, those aren't in there. And is that we do we do have some. We have like some. the two percent because I, we've been getting yep. that pretty steady now for a number of years. There's no inflation factor on top yep. of that, um, and we don't have like a huge enrollment influx in here either. Okay. So that's where going back to what I said what earlier when Heidi's question is. We have to continue to monitor and look at where we're at with our enrollment because that's our number one driver of how we get funds right on top of the state funding formula. But having the kids and the operational efficiencies of having our schools full is 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 a real plus to us. I just want to say in closing, I want to say a thank you to our SLT and to our principals and to our teachers. I know that it was difficult to hear the board's presentation last week, that there's been concerns around our teacher from our teachers. Um, and I know that our buildings have been working hard to, to implement this and make it happen. Um, if there could be, budget cuts are never easy. And to do them and to have this added on to all the things that we do from pandemic recovery is really challenging. And I just would like to, and I think as a board, I will say this out loud as you're all here, because I think you all support me in saying that it is the commitment of the school board to protect the student experience as much as possible, that we are doing our best to provide the best working environment for our teachers. And we look forward to continuing to partner with our families and our staff and our administration to serve our students and our district in the best way possible. So thank you to our community. Um, we do understand and, and we commit to um, doing our best to do the best for each and every student in this ever-changing global system. So, which is changing. So, um, with that, thank you. Uh, thanks to the finance department for continuing to work on that. Just a process reminder that we will have, um, uh, we will be looking to approve the budget hopefully at our June regular meeting. Um, it has to be approved by June 30th. Can so, I just say one other further yes. shout out? I have to really commend both the finance team and the HR team because we worked amazingly well together. Mm -hmm. And I know that Stacy and her staff right now, but they're doing the heavy lifting with, with the staffing and looking at all of that. So I can't I can't say enough about how well this went this year. Was slow, but went well. Thank you. Yes, thank you to HR. Thank you to Jill Schwint and the finance team and the and the HR team. Yeah, we have a good team. Thank you. Okay, all right, Dr. Anderson, we now move to superintendent reports and we'll start with a COVID health and safety update. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, and, um, team leadership team that's here at work today. Thank you so much. Uh, wouldn't be a real board meeting anymore without a COVID update. So uh, I'm just to throw this on just to give you a quick update. So uh, I've asked uh, Dr. Flansberg to join me, and I'll probably uh, walk us through the majority of the slides. I think this will be uh, one of the shorter COVID presentations probably that uh, we've had over the past uh, two years. But uh, important one nonetheless. It's uh, good to keep you up to date, keep our community up to date on uh, what's happening and what we're seeing. I always start out by uh, reminding everybody of our two primary goals. Of course, keeping uh, our uh, health and well-being of students and staff uh, front and center, and uh, keeping students in school every day throughout the school year. And uh, we're doing really well with that. So far, so good. And uh, uh, we're buying the finish line and uh, uh, planning to let that uh, uh, be the case throughout the remainder of the school year. So, I indicated at a uh, recent uh, school board meeting that we were anticipating waiting for some additional guidance from CDC. And I don't really want to read the entirety of those uh, two paragraphs, but these were uh, a couple of, of uh, excerpts that I think uh, were helpful. And to really, what the focus really is, is to uh, monitor current local conditions uh, for COVID-19 in regard to hospitalizations, and then also just the, the general uh, transmission rates within the community. So I'll share a few metrics here in a little bit to give you an update on uh, where we're currently at. So these are really the, the modified uh, uh, guidelines. I mean, we're accustomed to really thick, uh, long, a uh, set of protocols and guidance that has come to us from CDC and then reinterpreted by MDH and communicated to MDE and then out to school districts. So 
uh, it's gotten really kind of a more of a reader's digest version, if you will, and a lot less words and uh, helpful nonetheless, but it's uh, it looks different than it, than it used to. They're really kind of giving a lot more flexibility to the local uh, groups, I think, without a lot of uh, tight uh, restrictions or guidance. They just ask that you take a look at what are your local transmission rates or the local vaccination rates, uh, what are hospitalizations uh, doing, and uh, focusing on, on that. So um, that's the, the most recent guidance. They came out with this particular metric. Took me a while. I studied it to try to figure out exactly where all of the numbers fit in and, and found the, the place where um, the information can be uh, discovered for uh, these different categories. So if you look at the three color coding system um, and the yellow highlights of fewer than 200 or 200 or more, that lines up with that infamous Wilson number that we've been speaking about. The uh, number of cases over a seven day period per 100,000 residents as is indicated in that column above where it says fewer than 200 and 200 or more. And then if you work your way across, it speaks to the uh, indicators of uh, admissions to hospitals and, and percent of staff really testing my trifocals here, uh, uh, percent of staff uh, uh, ICU beds, I think it's, it's essentially what that second criteria is. The low transmission is demonstrated by the green and it's a, a less than 10% uh, for um, the, uh, those indicators for admissions and also ICU beds. And then for uh, medium and high, you can see that it has uh, indicators for both fewer than 200 and 200 or more for medium and high. So really what they're saying is when you're in the low and medium, you can probably get by with uh, lesser restrictive measures in schools and or anywhere that you're at really when indoors. When it gets to the higher uh, category, uh, those families or those individuals that might have uh, uh, underlying health conditions or other considerations that should be uh, taken into account uh, to strengthen their mitigation strategies at home or when they're out and about or uh, in school, um, they are, uh, you know, it's kind of left a little bit more to the individual and to the localities rather than uh, uh, organizations. Off to the left, you can see uh, I've included the Hennepin County number and the White of Schools number. I don't know, within the last week, uh, the numbers for Hennepin County, I think it says 56 maybe, and uh, the school district is 58. So clearly fewer than 200. And I think it's kind of hovering there yet. Might have bounced up a couple of points, but. Um, on the Wilson schedule, but it's still well under 200, well under 100, actually. So we're clearly in that uh, low uh, range. I think the hospitalizations and the avail and the utilization of uh, ICU beds seems like it was at about 3.8 the last I looked, and uh, the, the benchmark there is staying the lowest below 10. So um, we're in a really a, a pretty good place, and I just want to point out, speak to this metric. Uh, this really uh, constitutes the majority of the new guidance other than the, the couple of paragraphs that I shared before. Frankly, I kind of appreciate the simplicity and uh, finally getting to some clarification for that it was uh, helpful for us to receive that. Um, this uh, shows the hospitalizations in Hennepin County. I'm not too concerned about the charts, the graphs over on the right hand side. Again, it's really difficult to see, but you'll recall on the previous slide, um, anything below 10 keeps you in that green category or that low level of transmission. And you can see the two numbers there, 3.7 for uh, the hospitalization rate metric and 3.8, I think, for the uh, uh, utilization of ICU beds. So again, it's difficult to read, but you got to pull up on your computer, you can probably see it more clearly. But again, uh, in a good place with those two numbers, um, our vaccination rates have continued to be uh, pretty solid. We're just under 83% of the high school, uh, 80 and a half at our middle school. These are averages for those three buildings. And then at the elementary at about 71%, uh, district-wide average of just under 77% of having received the full uh, array of uh, vaccinations for those levels. I'm gonna zip through uh, these, uh, I think I have four maps now because every week they continue to get better or the dates that we've logged. So this, Again, your goal is to be in green, 
And uh, yellow is kind of in between the orange or the red colors. So you can see uh, uh, back in late February, not all that long ago, there was still quite a lot of transmission and, and uh, impact across the country. March 3rd, you can see more green, uh, more yellow, less red or orange. March 10th, uh, getting very green, kind of zeroing on Minnesota. They're still in the southeast part of the state. Um, some of the yellow area, and then the most recent on March 17th. I think that's the most recent. I might even have one more. Um, again, quite a lot of green, and uh, the most recent one, almost all green in Minnesota. So that's from about well, four days ago, the way it looks. So, uh, again, one more indicator that you know we're heading in the right direction um, in regard to this. Um, and then uh, this is our local data. You can see the continued drop off and kind of the leveling. These are the transmission rates for uh, staff and students combined by building, and also uh, I think anything uh, over five we uh, categorize and, and uh, itemize per building. And then we take the total cases, and, and where there are fewer than five in a building, I think we've had two counts now. The two right columns are all zeros. Uh, I take that back. It looks like there's a five there for one of our elementaries, but. Most of the case, most of the buildings have fewer than five cases uh, in those last two columns of data. The drop off is a little less dramatic because if you go back to week number one, um, compare that to like a few weeks ago, you might remember that bar graph really dropped rapidly. But now, you know, the change is a little less impactful in the way this chart uh, generates. Um, you know, it shows from uh, First column to the final. So it, it has leveled off a little bit, but it's leveled off at a, a, a really good rate for us. This is uh, our infamous chart of the local cities that comprise uh, the majority of our school district. You can see the nice trend lines on the far right column continuously moving downward. The color coding uh, red is long time in our past. I think that goes back to it looks like about January, uh, end of January, probably. And then the orange is that uh, intermediate step. Yellow is getting better, and green is really the goal. So we bounced into some of the green numbers uh, for the suburban areas, uh, kind of that cluster of uh, suburban areas in the Northwest and in the West and South. So again, uh, heading in the right direction with that. This is the uh, infamous Wolfson chart. This goes back to the end of January. And if you look at those, uh, Speedometers, I call them uh, on the left for Hennepin County, 1,486. And then on the right, Wayzata Schools uh, District, 1,560. I think Nate would affirm that uh, the highest we get was just under 2,000 at one That's point. That's right. Um, 1950. Yeah, 1950. So this was uh, back in late January. And I'm going to show you the, the, the process. You can see the continuous incline there on the, the bar charts of the line graphs uh, below. Um, a few weeks later, February 11th about, February 10th or 11th, you can see it dropped all the way down to 393 and 507. Numbers that look really good compared to the 15 or 1600, but would look terrible right now. Uh, if they were to bounce back up to that level, um, you can see that the big drop off, and it dropped out to 67 and 80 back in the uh, first week or two of March. And then uh, it's kind of leveled off here at this 52, 58 uh, count uh, on March 20th. So again, just a few days ago. Um, so it, again, a nice trend line downward. That's certainly where we want to be is down in that. You can barely see it, but there's sort of a yellow shaded area way at the bottom of those uh, uh, line charts that uh, it's kind of where you want to be. And that's where we're at. So um, again, a couple of uh, indicators. You might remember back on uh, February 25th, there was a change uh, in regard to wearing masks on buses and vans, and we made the switch at that time, short time thereafter. I can't remember the exact date, February 28th, I think, on a Monday. This came out late afternoon on Friday, February 25th. We made the shift to align with the updated guidance that no longer recommended universal indoor masking in K 12 schools at early ed settings. Uh, and, and that was in accordance with the CDC. That's the, remember we were waiting for the CDC guidance that kind of wasn't coming in. And then we got a couple short snippets that helped us guess sort of what it was. And then we got the metric and, and that I just shared with you. So 
Um, anyway, that's that was one of the benchmarks that was set where they removed the requirement on transportation. And that leads us to uh, what we're recommending at the current time. As you're all aware, uh, K through 12 is currently uh, recommended masking, not required. We've been in that mode. Um, frankly, I'm not recalling the specific date, but I think it was uh, the 14th. Right. We voted on the 14th yep, to be implemented right. on the 22nd. Thank you. So mid-February. And then uh, for transportation, it was removed at uh, the end of February, a couple of weeks later. And really the only uh, grouping that we currently still have required mass before is for our pre-K. And uh, uh, our recommendation is uh, Nate and I have been working with Joey Remsing, our Director of Special Services, and Jenny Ebert, our Director of uh, Early Ed. Um, We've been uh, in communication with them and having conversations about what should the next steps be for early ed. Uh, as I've demonstrated, the local conditions continue to see these uh, substantial improvements. As shown in the presentation, the county numbers are uh, dropping as well as our local school uh, district numbers and our individual school building numbers. Um, we've even heard that the new variant has been detected Pretty, pro pretty prevalent in our, um, I don't know how they do it, but I don't need to know how they do it, but assessing the wastewater uh, at the sewage plants or something on that, or else leave it at that. But uh, they're detecting there's quite a lot of it, but it hasn't really equated to a lot of illness or uh, serious concerns. So I know there's been some concerns and talk about what about when the three variant shows up? Well, I think it's here, and we're still continuing to be able to, to manage forward pretty well. So, uh, Nate and myself, uh, you know, along with uh, Jenny and Jody, are really recommending that we can make this move, or we think we can make this move to uh, recommended but not required for uh, pre K. And we probably recommend that we move to that on uh, starting on Monday, April 11th. So, it's a day after we come back from our uh, spring break. And then our pre-K through grade 12 would all be on the same routines. It all be at the recommended growth mode, but not required. Um, just to give a little bit of background around the metro, some districts have always been recommended for pre-K and not required. Um, I think the WHO has never really come out and uh, suggested a requirement for pre-K. But we've always taken our guidance from CDC and then MDH, and CDC and MDH have, uh, for much of the pandemic up until recently, uh, indicated they, that they recommend a uh, universal requirement for pre-K, and actually uh, for pre-K through grade 12, but they aren't in a position to uh, require it. So anyway, it's our recommendation that we move to full pre-K through grade 12. Um, to be recommended, not required, effective Monday, April 11th, for the day we come back from spring break. And uh, we're not asking for a vote. And, you know, at this meeting, we can't take a vote, but we'd like to exercise that clause of making an administrative decision. So I think that's our, yeah, thank you for uh, listening. And that's what we're recommending. So uh, anything I'll have to talk? No, I think, the, I think the big one is, again, just to reiterate, uh, when we saw that initial statement come up from the CDC, there was almost an indication that more guidance or more clarification would be coming. Then the last week or so, the Department of Health, the Minnesota's Department of Health, have really updated their language online to say, follow the community guidance by the CDC, including early childhood all the way through. So with that shift, we're aligning, and we've always said the CDC and MDH, and MDH is clearly articulating follow the community guidance so that's what we are recommending okay. all right thank you very much for that presentation and that consistency it is helpful um melinda i see your hand first okay um this is a curiosity question two years ago we were looking at modern hospitalization i see we were looking at that number so just out of curiosity now we have so such a small number of hospitalizations patients I see use. Well, the death numbers, I hope it's not negative, not, not non-existent, right? So we call it. Um, I don't know that it's non-existent, but it's very low. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the resistance apparently that has been built up, maybe there's an indicator with this new variant that it's been pretty good. Uh, 
natural immunity that has been strengthened. I'm not an MD or an epidemiologist, so I'm getting out a little over my skis here, maybe on this one. But um, I do think that the, the death rates have gone way down. Are they even publishing that? Um, I'm sure they are. I haven't been tracking it as closely because it wasn't part of this metric. So, uh, but there is a place on. Uh, uh, there's, you know, the NBH website that has access to all of that. We get the, the weekly updates on those, or maybe more frequent, but I think they come out weekly. And uh, there's access to these uh, metric numbers on that, uh, within that document. So I'm sorry I don't have more specific no, answers. I'm that. curious about that. You know, yeah. the metric well, I think it's, you know, the start of thousands at one time. The Star Tribune yes. had uh, an article just in the last week talking about how Minnesota had its first COVID free, uh, COVID, uh, a day with no COVID deaths associated with it. So we do know numbers are dropping dramatically in that area as well. And, you know, there's still pretty good evidence and data that, uh, you know, it's particularly for those that have been vaccinated and had the full series of vaccinations. It's been, you know, for those hospitalizations and deaths, it's been a lot more than um, for those that have not. Thank you. Jay. So, um, in terms of the decision on the on the pre-K, would we actually vote on that Monday night? Or I mean, that are, okay. No, um, just similar to, and I think Dr. Anderson said to exercise the class, we know that that happened with, um, in, in our original masking resolution, we always, um, kind of we, give them, yeah, we give the superintendent um, the flexibility. So um, this, this was the switch and this, and, and this feels congruent versus the changing because it's in the same category of guidance that came from the yeah. CDC that talked about transportation and early childhood. And so um, we did not do a vote on the transportation. It's congruent with what we're doing with a large population of our district, you know, our K-12 district. So yeah, this will be with discretion. Other questions? comments related to this. I am aware too, Dr. Anderson, that um and, and Dr. Flansberg that we had it at that we had a tie-in with with our vaccination rates um, for our K-12. And, and I know that you both have been anxiously uh, been watching those early childhood vaccination rates as of some of us on the school board um, been very aware. We know now that Moderna is also applying for some and, and we know that there's some some mixed reviews on that. So um, to the, any other, so we think, is it is it fair to say that we've been looking for the vaccinations? We were hoping that that would happen, and the fact that this just continues to get delayed and delayed, that it, it did not feel like a um, reasonable benchmark to look at for this age group. Uh, that's correct. That's a good reminder. Thanks for uh, sharing that with me. Uh, because when we, you may remember way back in August of uh, 2021, I think, we made the original proposal for how we wanted to begin the school year and we Masking and other mitigation strategies. And uh, we really built it somewhat on that vaccination timeline. And you might remember wording something to the effect of uh, uh, consideration for recommended masking will be given at the time, you know, at a reasonable time after the uh, implementation or availability of the vaccinations. And that kind of worked for high school, middle school, and elementary. And we were anticipating that the Pre-K was going to be coming out in a reasonable time frame too, and then it got delayed uh, with no uh, definite date on it. Although I heard that there is one now, I forget which uh, manufacturer it was that they're seeking uh, authorization to move forward with it before it full to the FDA. Yeah, FDA yeah. and then you're going to start with emergency use authorization, and then it goes to FDA. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so that may be happening soon. Um, but given the you know the new CDC guidance and all things related to early ed, um, we feel comfortable moving forward in this regard. And I you know that uh, both uh, Jenny and Joni will work closely with their constituents. And I think uh, the draft of the communication to go to families even as soon as later this evening to update them that on uh, April 11th we're we'll making this switch. And, I think I think it's okay and it's the time. It's a good time for us to move forward in this way. We'll keep monitoring it and probably keep bringing back yet more uh, presentations to you at future board meetings and work sessions. I look forward to the day when 
So there's going to be some general overviews and some updates. Uh, you'll recall that we established goals for the 2021 20, school year. We kind of just renewed those for 21-22 with one exception. There was one about realignment of the leadership administrative team. We knew that we were on the front end of some uh, retirements and uh, needing to replace the, uh, some key members in our, our leadership team, which three, at least three, are with us here at this table tonight. And uh, so we didn't renew that goal, but uh, we'll work through uh, the, the process of, uh, tonight and give you some updates. So this is something that we implemented last year with these check-ins. We've kind of been working on budget and COVID and other things during the course of the year. So this is kind of our first official check-in meeting. And I won't go in great detail, but I think we'll give you a good uh, uh, high-level overview. So the four goal areas that, uh, and again, these go back early to 2021, and then we rolled it forward to 21-22, included uh, improving racial equity across uh, West Idaho Public Schools, focusing on reducing the opportunity achievement gap, enhancing the focus on health and well-being of West Idaho students. And then uh, this fourth one is uh, newer, the new one for the current year that we include, and that's this focus on instruction. And we feel that uh, our engagement with the Center for Educational Leadership, which is centered at the University of Washington, and they're working in partnership with uh, the University of Minnesota. So we have a number of our team that is uh, participating in both the Principal Supervisor Academy, I think we have three principals, and our Instructional Leadership Academy, which uh, includes a number of our SL team members, and uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a little bit. So I'll share a few thoughts about uh, number one. Stacy is going to take the lead on uh, number two and provide some updates on standardized testing. As you know, that's kind of been blown off course as a result of COVID. So we have uh, data strands and year-to-year uh, -year data points for a number of years uh, that you've seen in previous board meetings or work sessions, uh, maybe with the exception of Milland and Heidi as new school board members, and maybe Jay as a returning school board member, but we will be giving the MCAs and other standardized tests again this spring. And then at the appropriate time when we get those results back, we'll be uh, providing some updates on that uh, as well. Um, so I also just want to point out that we have a number of operational things that we're focusing on. I heard a little bit about the budget last week and again tonight. So preparation of the budget obviously is a, a big lift for HR and uh, finance team right now. And all of us really continue to focus on that. Continued management of COVID, although I'd say it's getting easier, but that is, you know, comparatively, the lift on that is, is more manageable. And I don't think we're consumed 26 hours a day thinking about COVID and about it uh, nonstop and how we can best move forward. Um, aligning the work of our leadership team members. So I mentioned uh, some new team members, associate superintendent, executive directors of teaching and learning and finance, new director of athletics and activities. We're working on our directors of teaching and learning currently and uh, merging all of these new folks within our leadership council or SLT, which I didn't list on there, but that's our strategy leadership team, the subcomponent of leadership council, and all of our school principals and leaders and teachers in our buildings. And then uh, all of the other standard work that finds us on a regular basis. 
Um, you'll uh, recognize this document, our strategic roadmap. Um, I'd like to just give you quick reminders that we first developed that back in 2011. So that's been serving us for over a decade now, and I think really well. We reviewed and revised that in 2015 and then again in 2019. And uh, it's due to be reviewed, I don't know, either this year or maybe early next year, the board can kind of decide when it seems to make the most sense to do it. Probably would be good to get our new leaders kind of settle in and learn the lay of the land and, and uh, help them be positioned in a, a better way to uh, be really strong contributors to that. And not that they couldn't now, but it's kind of nice to get to know, you know the lay of the land a little bit, I think. So um, that would be something that will be on the radar for the coming year. Um, our mission, again, I think has served us really well. Our tagline is listed there, excellence for each and every student. That's sort of, again, the Reader's Digest version and the short version of the larger mission statement. But I will read this because I think it has uh, implications and, and the reinforcement will be good for uh, some of the other presentations that we're doing tonight. But the mission of Wayzata Public Schools is to ensure a world-class education that prepares each and every student to thrive today and excel tomorrow in an ever-changing global society. So I think our overriding goal is to really help ensure that our students enjoy the experience and the journey and not just looking forward to that destination of high school graduation or whatever, you know, moving on to middle school or high school, um, but really just enjoying and thriving today. And by uh, accomplishing that, we think that'll help position them to excel tomorrow. And the world is changing rapidly and uh, uh, continuing to uh, create new opportunities for all of our students. And you know, what can we do to help ensure that they're the best prepared for those next chapters that they possibly can be? Our vision statement, uh, recognize these three uh, areas, the exceptional student learning experiences and relationships, community trust, confidence, and partnership and operational excellence. And if we were to go back and look at the roadmap I showed you a little bit ago, you know that there are some bullet points underneath of each one of these, but we won't go into uh, all of that uh, with a great deal of detail. What we really want for our students to uh, you know, discover their unique talents and to love this, develop this love and tenacity for learning and, and have confidence uh, for their own capacity for future success. And we think through these three uh, key areas, uh, we position them in the best way possible. That uh, vision statement, many of you in the room have heard me talk uh, uh, on and on sometimes about this book, Discipline of Market Leaders. I think it's a really good organizational design book that we stumbled across uh, shortly before that 2011 timeframe where we created our new roadmap. And uh, we utilize this. I think it's been really helpful. And in a couple of uh, findings of this research that I've always really liked is that through this review and, and analysis of, of uh, organizations that they researched, they, they found really that uh, they, they have a high focus or a strong focus in all three of these areas, what they call product leadership, customer intimacy, and operational excellence. So three buckets, if you will, of essentials that solid organizations uh, need to have. And if you think back to this slide and then look at the uh, bullet point underneath each one of these, our product leaders, our products and our services really are exceptional student learning experiences and relationships. And customer intimacy is, uh, they called it, uh, the authors of this research called it, is that community trust, confidence, and partnership that we bring forth. And operational excellence kind of stands uh, on its own, where it's that balance of efficiency and effectiveness. You've got to hit that sweet spot as, to the best of your ability. You're never going to bat a thousand on any one of these three. But one of the findings was if you're not really hunting at a high level in all three of these areas, you probably weren't on that list of these outstanding organizations that they looked at. And then it might be a little more applicable in the business world, but uh, successful businesses focus on one of these and because they don't have resources to drive all three off the charts, but they have to kind of choose the area where they can be. And again, I think it's a little less applicable in that finding, maybe for uh, public schools or other public entities, but not completely. I think you can still kind of prioritize on where you want to be. And just to kind of give you a quick visual, um, I'll just share a few organizations that are sometimes uh, highlighted or, or included with this, but a, a product leader would be, for example, Apple. So whatever comes to mind for you right now with Apple, that's a product leader. 
the customer intimate organization would be sometimes Nordstrom's or IBM are listed for that, being responsive to the unique needs of the, the customer. Not so much about here's what we have to offer and what we want to sell you, but what do you need? And here's what we can provide to you. And we know that you need this. We're not, we're, we're not as good at that. You might want to think about going to one of our vendors or competitors or somebody else. And again, the overriding goal is we want our customer to be satisfied. And we're doing whatever we can and need to to help make that happen. And then finally, uh, for operational excellence, sometimes uh, uh, Walmart or uh, Southwest Airlines are identified as an operationally excellent organization. High quality products, maybe not uh, as much glamour or as much of the uh, you know, special touches maybe on, on design and, and uh, the effect that they establish, but high quality product that, and meets that need. So probably more than everyone know about this book, but it's a pretty good model. I like the organizational design to it. That's a lot like uh, Jim Collins' Good to Great. Um, personally, I think it's stronger because of this model that it laid out. And, uh, but I think a lot of the similar types of things uh, uh, that they looked at. Um, our core values include uh, six. They're, the first three include achievement, collaboration, community. And these have stayed pretty uh, uh, steady throughout the, the course of the life cycle of our roadmap as well. And then our other three are equity, integrity, and respect. And again, I think they've uh, served us well and actually were used as we developed uh, our equity commitment and the board took action on last April. Really our goal with that was to help strengthen our mission and vision to help bring forth this excellence for each and every student and to help ensure that we are delivering on that. Um, we still have varying degrees of, of uh, Success within our school district. We strive for a very high level of uh, excellence for each and every student, as our mission calls us to do. And uh, the, at the outset, this development of this was to help amplify our core values and to uh, help us realize the goals of the four strategic directions, which are uh, achievement, each and every personalization, and health and quality. So we continue to focus on these and how do we bring forth uh, and uh, uh, bring forth good measures on how we determine how we're doing all these things. And it's been kind of frankly a sort of an ongoing challenge for us. And COVID certainly hasn't helped any of these because some of our committee work and some of the focus that we have brought to this, uh, that energy had to be channeled elsewhere. Um, but we've uh, teachers could not have done a better job of stepping up and helping to deliver our curriculum to uh, continue to uh, work toward delivering on achievement and, and uh, helping us uh, close our achievement gaps and uh, personalizing learning and also being focused on the health and well-being of our students. So it's more than just about academics, but it's about their uh, physical, mental health and well-being as well. Um, so just to share a little bit about goal area number one. So these are some of the detailed specifics that were brought forth to me at the end of the, probably the 1920 school year, I believe. And then we developed uh, goals for the 2021 and carried them over to the 21-22 design period. Uh, but the focus, uh, a couple of the focus areas and a, a couple of them I think we uh, achieved and moved forward from that. Uh, reviewing our curriculum areas and recommendations to ensure that uh, for the short term and long term, uh, our efforts to enhance racial equity are in place. Strategies to attract, hire, and retain more employees of color for teaching and staff positions. And uh, the third one that I've, uh, I don't know, as I put more thought to this presentation and what we uh, should be sharing with you, I think it's, you know, for me, it really kind of boils down to preparing students to be successful in the 21st century. Um, by ensuring their readiness for their post-secondary experiences and make those future employers. And again, uh, that focus on those goals are in line with our mission statement, which I won't read again since I read it before, but uh, I thought it seemed to fit here. And I wanna uh, just highlight again, ensuring that readiness for post-secondary experiences, whatever they may be, whether it's a two-year school, four-year school, or entering the workforce and uh, determining your interest in ongoing educational needs uh, after graduation. Sometimes we have students that fit into all of those categories and regardless of what a student might choose, we want for them to um, feel that they're well prepared for that next step. And uh, keeping uh, that and 
the work they'll do with their future employers in mind. Um, these are the, there's actually 11, I say top 10, but there was a tie. So we have 11 colleges and universities where almost 50% of our graduates, 50% of our students who went on to a two or four year school, they went to uh, these schools. So about 90% of our students go on to a two or four year uh, college or university when they're not finished with high school. And of those who went on, about, about half went to these uh, 11 organizations. So the, the breakdown of the numbers here are included here, but you can see the data at the bottom. A total of the top 10, it's actually top 11. 354 of last year's 776 uh, Wayzata High School graduates that went on to a two or four year school. 45.6% um, went to these 11 places. Um, and so those attending school also was 54.4%. So they were scattered from all across the country. We have kids probably at every college or university in the nation, probably whatever, I guess over a four year period. And our total college bond students, uh, 776 of our 866 graduates last year had indicated that they're intent to go to a two or four year school. I was kind of interested uh, in alignment with our mission to help prepare students for uh, the global world that uh, our mission calls us to help prepare students for. I thought it'd be kind of interesting to pull these 11 schools up and uh, just do a little bit of research online about you know, what, are, what is their focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I've included the websites here. I'm not going to pull them up or speak to any one college or university. I don't feel authorized to speak in behalf of these uh, colleges and universities. But for your convenience, I included them here. So again, about 50% of our students that are heading off to a uh, two or four year school are heading to uh, these uh, enterprises. And uh, they all have uh, some presence and some uh, focus, obviously, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I also did a little research on our Fortune 500 companies in Minnesota. Listed about 18 um, in their ranking and uh, total revenues. So those numbers are, are bigger than I can probably even recite, but those are in uh, uh, billions actually of, uh, of dollars. So I thought for a dramatic effect, I would just put the whole number there instead of uh, <laughs> <laughs> it made me feel it was sort of fun to put those big numbers on. There. But it's pretty impressive. Minnesota's always been known for having a pretty significant number of uh, Fortune 500 companies. And a lot of our graduates eventually are going to work for you know these companies. You know, I don't know what percentage. I don't have that data. Maybe it exists somewhere, but I don't have access to it. I don't know what it would be. But this, these are the workplaces that a lot of our graduates are, are heading to. And again, um, I was curious just to kind of find out what is what are their uh, areas of focus for DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, listed a couple pages of them here that have a presence on their website indicating the efforts that they're making and the value they're placing on diversifying the workforce and recognizing that that enhances the creativity and the, uh, the work that they're doing within their organization. So, pretty impressive list of uh, corporate uh, enterprises there. And uh, uh, some looking very familiar uh, to uh, some of us in the room or all of us, certainly. So, um, you can pull those web links up, I think, from your board book if you're so inclined, and you won't have to go scrounging for them on your own. So, I just thought it might be interesting for uh, uh, you to give that some consideration. So, that's sort of a quick flyover of goal number one. So, the overriding theme of that is how do we best prepare our students who are graduating for their post secondary educational experiences and their future employment? And uh, it's a, a reminder that we do have a role and responsibility in that. And uh, having that be infused throughout the work that we're doing across the district. And what you're going to hear about uh, now that uh, Stacy's going to share a little bit more about is this focus on reducing the opportunity achievement gap for our students. And if you go back to that uh, uh, vision statement, there was three prompts, you know, that idea what are our products and services that we deliver to our students? That's got to be really strong to help us achieve this. And what are our operations that are in place to ensure that our funding and our priorities are supported within the, the budgets and, and just the human resources that we're bringing to our uh, school districts? How do we help ensure that there's good alignment with that? And then, of course, that uh, ongoing focus on our, our customers, our students, their families, our larger community. We really have within the footprint of the school district about 70,000 customers. Who are, you know, comprise the residents in our district, of which about 24,000 are parents and, 
and 12,000 are students. So somewhere right around half are directly connected to the schools. Uh, if, if you do the math on it, I think. I think my math is pretty close on that. But um, anyway, these are some of the things that we focused on was, uh, you know, focusing on the opportunity achievement gaps. And because we use MCAs so much for that, it's been kind of tough over the last few years because we really don't have good data for the last couple of uh, testing cycles. And uh, we'll be back in business with that, I think, this year. Continuing to focus on short, medium, and long-term uh, plans to help reduce these gaps. Uh, refreshing our scorecard kind of looks a little different each year, but it's been really different the last couple of years because a lot of the data points weren't available to us. And uh, also doing our best to learn from what did we learn from the pandemic and how can we incorporate those things we learned in crisis to uh, help make us better. And I think a lot of what we're doing today, I don't think I can give you a quick list, but I've had a lot of instruction happening in the schools now while kids are back in person is strengthened as a result of the challenges that our teachers face. And I think that'll continue to be refined. But at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Lecter, who's uh, going to share a few slides here that relate to this. Theory. Um, so what I'd like to do first is just provide a little background and a refresher about how we're approaching our student outcomes data this year. Um, so last uh, summer, both Solveig Haraday and I were recommended this book, Street Data, uh, from different from different um, people in different circles that we're in. And so we took a deep dive into this over the summer, and we had our um, building principals and our district leadership read through this um, approach to looking at student outcome data from multiple different levels, especially with our learning among with the pandemic, is that we had different types of data available to us. So the, the ideas in this book by um, Shane Safir and Jamila Dugan, um, and I, I I apologize, I don't have the citation here on the slide, but I will get that. Um, the premise of that is that there are three different levels of data. You've got the broad overview of um, trends and um, the things that are going on at, for the broad um, population of students. So that's your MCA data, the state accountability data, graduation rates, um, attendance, all of those things that tell you how the system is doing as a whole. Then you have the next level of data, which is what they call the map data. So that's a little bit closer to the individual student, and that's your student um, and family surveys, common assessments, district standardized assessments. And then you also at the bottom or at the, the closest level to the student, you've got your street data. Um, you're looking at formative assessments, uh, school um, student work, interviews with students, and all of all of those really rich pieces of information that um, tell the uh, teacher and the student how they're learning and how they're progressing. So we have our buildings are doing a lot this year around street data and collecting that information in the classroom. What I'm going to talk about um, today is the satellite data and the map data that we're, we're also collecting this year. So first, I want to talk a little bit about the satellite data. So we know that we are part of the state and federal accountability system where we have to measure our student progress on um, standards. And for the academic standards, we have the MCA and the MTAS. For English learner proficiency standards, we have the access for ELs. And I'll go into that in the next few slides. Then we also have our college and career readiness data. So we're looking at ACT plus writing, practice ACT, and then ACT 89. So first, just to talk a little bit about the MCA and MTAS data, um, just for those of you who may be new or just need a refresher, um, the MCA and MTAS measure the degree to which schools are teaching the academic standards adopted by Minnesota. So all of our students in grades three through eight and 10 take the reading test. Students in grades three through eight and 11 take the math test. And students in grades five, eight, and high school take the science test. Most students take the MCA, so the Minnesota Comprehensive Assessments, and our students with the most significant cognitive needs, about 1% of our students take the Minnesota Test of Academic Skills. So they're both tests within the um, Academic Accountability State Testing System. For the school year, um, we don't have, there are no COVID-related administration, administration exceptions. Previously, in the 2021 school year, we were allowed to um, have parents opt into a COVID-related excuse, or they, they could opt out due to COVID reasons. That's no longer the case this year. Students either have to take the test 
or unless they have a medical, they can't, if they have a medical excuse, then that would be a reason not to take the test. So those are two options, students test or they have a medical excuse. And as in, in all years that we've had the MCA, parents still can opt out of the test. However, that's not something that, um, that's something that in the accountability calculations that actually comes against us when parents opt out of tests. So we no longer have the option for parents to opt out due to COVID reasons and have it not count against us in the accountability system. There are some um, calculation um, adjustments that the state is making to the accountability system. So um, the federal um, government call is, refers to it as the Every Student Succeeds Act, um, that's ESSA. And in Minnesota, it's called the North Star Accountability System. And in that, uh, for the um, achievement data, typically they look at three years of data to make those calculations um, to identify schools for need. And because of the pandemic, they have submitted a request for adjustment, which has been approved by the um, US Department of Education, that they're only gonna be looking at two years to calculate the, um, the district or the school need instead of three. And they'll be using the 2019 and 2022 results where the 2019 um, results will be weighted twice as much as the 2022 results. Um, and then also just to let you know where we are in the testing season, our MCA testing started on Wednesday of last week, March 23rd, and we'll go through um, May 13th. That will be the end of our testing window. So the next set of assess assessments for um, accountability are our access for ELL assessments. And this measures um, students' English language proficiency based on the WIDA at English language standards that were adopted by the state of Minnesota. So all of our English learners in grades K through 12 take the access test every year, and students must score proficient on this test in order to exit EL services. And again, similar to the MCA and MTAS, there are no COVID-related administration exceptions for 2022. So our access for ELs window actually ended last Friday. They started in January, um, January 31st, and they went through March 25th for test administration. So the next set of satellite assessments I have are the college and career readiness assessments. And what we use in our district are the ACT um, suite of assessments. So these ACT assessments um, measure the student um, high school student performance on the ACT college and career readiness standards. So and for our 11th grade students, we offer the ACT plus writing to all of our 11th grade students. We offer the pre-ACT to our 10th grade students. And then it, the ACT company also has a pre-ACT specifically for eighth and, and eighth and ninth grade students. So we offer that to all of our ninth grade students at the high school. We had our ACT testing day on March 8th, and we had a pretty significant um, participation with the ACT for all three grade levels, for the ACT, pre-ACT, and the pre-ACT and then last, we also have our level of student outcome data at the, at the MAP level. So for the elementary level, across the district for all of our schools in grades two, K through two, we have our English language arts assessments. Then for grades two through five, we have our fast bridge assessments, um, specifically A reading and A MAP. And then at the middle school level, um, we administer the NWBA MAP assessments in grades six to eight. And um, that's what I have for um, just an update on our student outcome measures. Stacy, and I put a place over here just for goal number three, but we really don't have a report on this for tonight. I know our health and well-being committee. I think does that mean later this week, or is it? Yeah, so we're going to be having a meeting, and we'll pick up and and uh, start focusing again a little bit more on this, so we don't have a, a report on this tonight. But I would like to uh, turn it over to Dr. Plansberg uh, to give an update on the CEL work that we're doing. And really, a uh, you know, key driver for almost everything we do is high quality instruction, right, within the classroom, between the classroom teacher and students and classmates, and uh, helping ensure that we maximize that. Um, I think, and we believe, and I think as an organization generally, believe that that's where the, the main event occurs and where. We can leverage the best return on investment in ensuring that what happens within that classroom uh, is really strong and solid. And, uh, Dr. Plansberg is going to be speaking a little bit about this uh, Center for Educational Leadership. Uh, 
with his previous employer, he had experience uh, with this, uh, with some really great success, and just uh, understands the program pretty well. It's relatively newer and still evolving, but he'll speak uh, uh, to the work that we're doing and uh, share any evidence that you'd like to with that. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to be able to present to you again a little bit of an update on what we've discussed previously regarding the University of Washington's uh, Instructional Leadership Academy, their Principal Supervisory Academy, and the partnership that's really happened in the last couple of years with the University of Minnesota. And goal number four, why are, I think it's important to be able to recognize and talk about why are we focusing on this partnership? Why are we kind of going in this direction to be able to say, well, it's a really good program, but what's our compelling why? And it really goes back to Dr. Lackner's uh, conversation regarding um, our goal number two, that we have opportunity gaps and we have achievement gaps, and we need to be able to acknowledge that and be able to recognize that, you know, as a high-performing school district, we want to be able to focus on why, why we exist. What is our mission? Again, it goes back to to improve, to ensure a world-class education that prepares each and every student to thrive today and excel tomorrow in that ever-changing global society. So when we talk about each and every, what does that mean and what does that look like when we know that, that, that we do have some gaps and what can we do about it? So how do we succeed and through that alignment work? And it really is alignment work that has to take place and it starts here in this room, it starts at the board level, the superintendent level, our strategic leadership team, down to our principals, to our teachers, and our students. This is called the, uh, the through line of instructional leadership. When we are here, we are all here for one reason, to ensure that our students have the best education that they can receive, no matter who they are. So I'll go back again. Our data does show that we have some achievement gaps, and it's our obligation to respond to this information in a way to help us close these gaps on behalf of our students and families. And as Dr. Anderson mentioned, my prior experience was working through the Instructional Leadership Academy and really having that opportunity to see that work in action. And even uh, coming on board when I was onboarding, one of my uh, reflections of that program is why did I like it? What was it that drew me to the work that was taking place? And I was able to be able to see how it actually aligned with prior best practice work already. Right? It wasn't something that was new in many ways, but it was intentionally focused. And it was really driven on what are we doing in helping principals do better to help our teachers get better? And how are those systems really ending up in place to align our system? So the first thing that we begin with is the Principal Support Academy. And right now, uh, most of the members of the strategic leadership team uh, are attending the Principal Support Academy because it goes back to that through line of, of the alignment. And as a school board, you expect high expectations across the board. As a superintendent team, Dr. Anderson and I have those same high expectations. We want to be able to support our principals, and this is where the research will come in, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, about why principals are going to be a significant lever in this work. So when we look at the Principal uh, Supervisory, Supervisory Academy, we know that successful principal supervision requires new ways of supporting principals in a partnership role. Leading by teaching and learning in an atmosphere of mutual accountability. It's that reciprocal accountability that is key. We want to see the principal performance improve at scale, but find it challenging to lead for it. Principal Supervisory Academy gives our principals leadership strategies that are centered on supporting instructional leadership growth. I think we can all think back to what many of us might have experienced with principals when we were all growing up. I know I can think back to my elementary days. The principal, you know, was where you did not want to go if you were in trouble. You know, you needed to behave in the classroom so you were not sent to the principal's office. Uh, the principalship was really, uh, at many, many years ago, very uh, focused on operations. And teachers were focused on achievement. So we talk about what drives principal's contributions and why are we making some of these shifts and really leveraging the work that our principals are doing. It's engaging that, in that instructionally focused interactions with teachers, calibrated walkthroughs are a significant portion of that, producing a productive school climate. When you walk into the buildings, you know that you are welcome, they are inclusive, 
uh, kids feel that they belong, and that's part of uh, the strategic goal. When we talk about whole child coming into a building, not only do they feel welcome, know they belong, they have adults that they know care about them, they have other kids that they can connect with, and they're going to be challenged academically to really high and rigorous levels. We want to talk about uh, really focusing on facilitating that collaboration within the professional learning communities. I'm actually going to cycle back to this at the end of the PowerPoint when we talk about some of the MTSS work that we're also going to be engaging in as part of the overall work around this. And then managing personnel and resources strategically. Where are our needs? Where are the students who are uh, specifically needing additional supports? And how are we building our systems and structures to provide those sports supports very specifically to each and every individual? Make sure it's not about equality, everybody gets the same thing, but the equity side of it and making sure that each and every student gets exactly what they need. So when we talk about what impacts learning, <coughs> there are some things that I want to highlight. And this is out of John Addy's work. And a, a, he's a professor who's done a significant meta-analysis of uh, hundreds of research articles. And he says, what are the biggest levers that bring about uh, high achievement within classrooms? And you can see at the top, there's being passion. I really believe, and that's um, when we talk about implementation fidelity and believing that as a teacher, you make a difference. If you believe you can make a difference, you will make a difference. You're all in. But also monitoring the impact. When we talk about the uh, PLC cycle, that plan, new study act, it's that ability to go back, review, what is the impact of actually having on student achievement? What do principals do within helping support the PLCs within their buildings? How are they helping monitor the impact and the learning? So teachers are planning collaboratively within a team. They're going out, focusing on instruction, instructional strategies. They come back, they review the data. And once that data is reviewed, knowing which students need additional support and what are they individually going to be able to do about that? When we talk about strong relationships, we focus and realize that's one of the main uh, reasons we build those strong relationships with kids, with teachers. And we know that when kids feel that they have somebody to connect with, they're going to work harder in those relationships. And also professional development. And I'm going to focus on that last one, evidence-based teaching. So we really want to, as Dr. Anderson talked about, refine and get better at instruction. When we get better at instruction, students can give what they need individually. So that high impact, the top range of factors which greatly accelerated learning were contributed by the teacher themselves or the teacher teaching instructional strategies. And I'm gonna really highlight the third bullet point, emphasizing feedback. Feedback's not only important for students, it's important for teachers. And that's what the Principal Supervisory Academy focuses on for us, is calibrating what high quality feedback looks like for teachers to improve instruction in the classroom. Again, the compelling why, we know that teacher quality is the number one impact on student learning. Principal quality is the number two. So we recognize effective principal supervisors leads to effective principal leadership, leads to effective teaching, which leads to student success for all. We talked about before, what is the research that actually shows us that principals make that impact? So commissioned by the Wallace Foundation, it was a, a synthesis of two decades of research and showing that principals had a far greater reach on student achievement than was previously thought. In fact, principals in the top quartile, in an average student, and I'd like to be able to focus on that, not just the high achieving students, an average student gains an additional three months of instructional knowledge if they have a high achieving principal. So what does that mean and what does that look like? They're providing feedback to teachers. They're doing regular walkthroughs. They know what high quality instructional strategies look like, and they're engaging with teachers proactively in a collaborative nature to be able to improve instruction in the classroom. Principal effect. So we also know that studies demonstrate that schools who have more effective principals have lower student absenteeism and chronic absenteeism. They have improved teacher reports of their working conditions. They have higher teacher job satisfaction and reduced teacher turnover, particularly of effective teachers. We hear this frequently across the nation. We know that 50% of teachers across the nation leave teaching within the first five years of the profession. It's unsustainable for our profession to be able to, to maintain that with constant turnover. We want to be able to retain high quality teachers, support them, and keep them. 
And how do they do that? Principals, they report that they want to stay in the profession and they're getting constant feedback and helping them improve and do their jobs exceptionally well. And teachers are the same. Teachers are seeking a supportive uh, relationship with their principals to help them improve and meet the needs of each and every student within their room. We want our teachers to be highly effective, and we want that partnership between the principals and the teachers to be the highest level they can be. So we also recognize that sometimes there are professional learning challenges. When students are not happy and proud, they're not being provided the expert experiences they need. So when students are walking into a building and they're not feeling that joy of walking in, they miss out on instruction. Creating a school where student experiences teaching and learning in powerful ways is sophisticated work. You might remember a few work sessions ago, uh, Principal Mary Nagasi talked about uh, how she was amazed by the complexity of teaching. She's been doing this job a long time, and she says, it never ceases to amaze me when I walk into a classroom and looking at the complexity and the levels of complexity across the board that is happening all the time to really improve high quality instruction for students. To be able to improve its sophisticated and complex work, it provide, requires a culture of public practice and analysis. This is where those walkthroughs really come in, those calibrated walkthroughs that we do together. So principals going into classrooms, uh, there'll be times where I'm joining them, there'll be times that they're doing them together. We have three principals who are currently engaged in this, and in fact, in just a couple of weeks, they're, you know, uh, they're doing their next rounds of instructional walkthroughs with other districts to be able to calibrate what high quality instruction looks like. They go into rooms, they watch what's happening, and they come back out and they talk about the instruction. That, that's what we'll be talking about, making things public. So it's not going into the classroom, closing my door, what happens in my room stays in my room. So we really want to be able to engage at high levels of conversation. Leaders set these conditions with reciprocal accountability. Feedback is a gift. And for teachers to be able to receive feedback, they need to be able to see it as a gift and it needs to be given as a gift. So it can't be used in, in a way that is negative. So really the feedback that the principals are learning, this is where it's, it's hard for our principals because they're needing to be able to learn what are the noticings and wonderings, and being able to provide the sentence steps and the feedback in really non-judgmental ways for the teachers to be able to recognize it's a partnership. We're here to be able to support them in getting better. And it's not meant to be a, a way to, to bring judgment upon the work that's happening in the room, but really increase the, the productivity and effectiveness of what's happening there. Hitting on that last bullet point, point we just cannot leave what they're not willing to learn. And we focus on that. Why? Because expertise matters. Becoming an expert in this work is what moves the needle. And becoming an expert means we need to practice. So our principals are going to be working on this over the next number of years. It's not, you know, when we, we don't learn to play the piano the first time and you sit down and you practice pounding on those keys and go, all right, well, now I'm the expert. I've done it once or I've done it half a dozen times. It takes hundreds and hundreds of times. And that's what will need to be happening over the next number of years is for our principals to continue on these calibrated walkers, providing feedback, practicing them uh, on a regular basis and doing so with one another. Why is this work important? Again, really talking about the old methods. You know, stopping by for school celebrations. So this is for those of us who support principals. Just checking in, see how it's going, and you know, working in silos, having buildings, being able to kind of do their own thing. Well, that works in my building, but it might not work in a different building. You no, know, we're making all of these decisions top down without collaboration. What we really want to be able to focus on are kind of those new methodologies, those calibrated walkthroughs, being able to go into a classroom. I should be able to go into a classroom with a principal, walk through the room, and be able to talk about what do you see? What are you noticing? What are your wonderings? What's the feedback that you might be considering on giving that teacher? And really uh, having our principals develop that as well. Talking about the and it says weekly data dives at every school, that's the PLC work that teams are doing. And they need to really be disaggregating that data on a regular basis. So when they uh, have finished, if they've given a pre-assessment, they've given the post-assessment, what is the student learning that has taken place? If we have students that have not hit those learning moments, what are we gonna do about it? And being able to then come up with plans to be able to provide additional instruction and not just assume, well, I need an intervention teacher to be able to set them off to those moments. The shared vision for the principal supervisory role is focused on growth and learning. Principal feedback, evaluation, you know, it, it's really not that, no longer that unique take on the role. It's not just about, well, 
I'm going to do it my own way. It really is allowing principals to talk to one another and setting up those conditions for allowing them to be the instructional leaders of their buildings. So the principals, you know, there's the principal supervisory academy, and then the principals themselves are going through the instructional leadership academy. Again, you've seen this slide before, but again, developing those practices about collecting qualitative data, getting targeted feedback, and planning strategic feature learning that can have an, an impact right away. So what we're looking for is what are teachers almost there to be able to move to the next level. It's not like uh, finding the, the area that a teacher might have to make the biggest growth in, it's what are they almost the expert in and where can we give those little nudges to improve teachers systematically? They're almost there, we're helping them achieve that next step and then we move on to the next step. It's continuous improvement as a cycle. Again, you've seen this one, the Instructional Leadership Academy, it's that year-long job embedded research-based program. And I think that's the key, it's research-based. We've seen the results. Having done this myself and having to let this up again, the reason I talk about why it resonated so well with me, it, it, it started to place uh, terminology to some of the things and practices I was doing that I didn't have terminology for. And I looked at it and went, well, this makes sense. And now I'm understanding what I was trying to lead up and talk to my teachers about in the building. And what I preached with alignment practices for so long with my colleagues in my last district that uh, made sense to me. It, it really walked away to me to be found sense in so many ways. But then I wanted to be able to hit on some of the MTSS work that we're also focusing on and recognizing that multi tiered systems of supports, it's a structure and a framework. When we talk about, we do not want principals and teachers kind of signing their own, well, this is how it works in my room, or this is how it works in my building. We really want that calibrated expectation of what is our system expectation? How are we maximizing the needs and supports for students across the board? So everything from data and assessment and literacy to the evidence-based practices, we want to improve on what we're doing. Calibrating intervention teachers and supports, and what are we doing for each and every student who might need that? What, is, what does a tier two intervention mean? What does that look like in practice? What does a tier three intervention look like for students? What does tier one look like in a classroom? and being able to identify that and provide those supports as we build the, the system. This is where, as I mentioned earlier, the PLC becomes part of this work, professional learning community of the PLC, for teachers to be able to really drill down into the data and define what are those next steps, and being able to partner with their colleagues if they're stuck, and being able to go, boy, in the vulnerability when we talk about those open moments about my results weren't as good as someone else's results. So what did you do differently in your classroom that I can learn from to improve my instructional practices in my room and being able to achieve those successes? So there's a lot of work that goes into this framework. There's a lot of work that goes into the training that principals are going through, that our leadership team is going through. It's uh, pretty rigorous learning, and it really is driven on that equity statement about each and every and providing each and every student what they need, because it's not about everybody gets the same. And we recognize that everybody comes to us with the same needs across the board. So how are we meeting the individual? And that's a, a huge emphasis on this work. So that's the end of the, the wrap up on where we are. Again, we're gonna continue with the Principal Supervisory Academy. We actually are gonna be finishing that up uh, in the fall. We had to delay it because uh, one of our uh, meetings were supposed to be towards the end of January when you know, we had a COVID spike and we decided to push that out a little bit. So we actually had our first uh, meetings just uh, about three weeks ago, and our next ones are in June, and the final one, I can't remember if it's September or October, for us to be able to finalize that. So there's homework assignments that are actually a part of that work as well, and we think about those partnerships with the principals. There's a lot taking place. Questions? Fantastic. Well, thank you, Dr. Flansberg. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Dr. Lechner. Um, this really was a comprehensive uh, report. So, um, board colleagues, questions and comments? Dylan. Dr. Anderson, I noticed there are 18 Fortune 500 companies, but uh, did you know that Medtronic was one of them a while ago, two years ago, and it's not anymore because they moved to Ireland. The report was uh, used to 19. So, only 15 of the 18 listed here have a focus on DEI that we could, we could find. Polaris and Fastenal and I believe Fats are not listed for the DEI aspect. Yeah, I went on the websites and they were 
easily located. I, I pulled the link, but um, if they aren't listed there, I wasn't able to find that presence on the website. So this is it's not for me to suggest they don't have a focus right. on that. I just wasn't able to find it on that article. Dr. Lackman, I have a question for you. Um, you heard of the uh, Features of Color Act, right? That this legislature is working on. They started last year. They are working on it this year. And uh, one of the reasons they did that, uh, it's basically to increase the number of teachers of color in schools. And I think why is it a high school, why is it a school district? From what I saw in, in 2019, we had 95% white teachers was disproportionate to the number of white students. And therefore, you know, it's very important that <coughs> you look at that act and you know do what, what they recommend. So is that something that you know that we have started uh, Dr. Anderson? That's something we have looked at. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I can just share that in our world's best workforce report back in the fall, we did report on our um, percentage of, of staff teachers of color. Um, so that is in one of our goals and I know that that's and I know that um, Stacy Stacy Boss and the HR department has a lot of work that they've been doing for the last few years around that. Is there the matrix that you would be pulling the other matrix? That's something that we still need to figure out um, moving forward with our scorecard this year. We've got a lot of different things and some things have changed. It is part of our world's best workforce report on an annual basis. Um, and it's just a matter of where do we fit that in, but definitely it is something that we're we are required to report each year. Okay. Linda, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. First of all, thank you very much. I get very excited about hearing all those things. Um, one of the things I particularly liked, um, Dr. Anderson, that you mentioned was about uh, not only thriving today, but really enjoying the journey as well. And I think that ties into our emphasis, which you did, Dr. Flanberg, emphasis on instruction, but as well the emphasis on building relationships. I think that was part of it and how really good instruction, how important the relationship is, um, because I, it seems as though students really work harder, work better, et cetera, when there's a, they feel this support and a relationship with the teacher. So I was glad to see that that was part of um, what the principals are looking for also. So thank you all. Chair, sure. I just wanted to piggyback on what Linda said. First of all, thank you. Second of all, the, that relationship piece, it seemed to me that when you were presenting um, the relationship between the principal and the teachers is also super important. And that just sort of permeates all levels of everything. I think that sort of speaks to building and sort of accentuating this culture that we want to trust and support it. And, and like, so it, it really makes a lot of sense. And I'm excited to see what we're going to look Yeah. Yeah. So thanks again. I, uh, I just have a couple of comments in the province for one question. The uh, comments that I have that what you were saying, super excited about everything that you're saying, uh, especially when you talk about emphasizing uh, feedback and high quality of that uh, partnership, uh, a gift of feedback, those type of things. I think uh, it resonates with me that uh, I've seen that demonstrated and worked very well. Uh, if people become open to receiving feedback and not feel like they're being criticized. Uh, a question that I have is, are there a common set of uh, competencies as that everybody's kind of on that even playing field to understand what's expected of their behavior as they're going through this? So there's a couple different sets of behavior. So when we're looking at it on my end as, as the supervisor of the principals, I work from a, a different level of standards. Uh, there's CCSSO, and I wish I could remember the exact acronym and what each of those pieces were working from, but it really is a national set of standards for how to be able to support principals and what's the expectation 
and uh, providing feedback and, and alignment there. Uh, and then for the principals and teachers, it's the five dimensions of teaching and learning that is a part of the uh, Center for Educational Leadership framework that they use. And it's that common language, and what does that actually mean? And so it really is instructionally driven, and it breaks it down into five dimensions of everything from classroom culture to uh, classroom environment to uh, the teaching and learning aspects of it. So those are the pieces that we'll make sure that they're in the principal's hands and they're conversing and then we'll get it in teacher's hands because it needs to be aligned. It can't be a secret. You know, it needs to be very public and out there. What are we looking for? The five dimensions of teaching and learning and, and what does that look like? Now, it, it also doesn't mean here's the five dimensions of teaching and learning. Go master this. That's a lot of work, you know, and being able to say, what are we talking about when I walk into a room and I'm looking for high quality literacy instruction? What are the things I'm beginning to look for? Do I know that I should be looking for a classroom library? Do I know that I should have hundreds of titles in it? Do I know that they should have hundreds of titles that are a variety of options for the students when they're walking into the classroom? Uh, do we know what small group instruction should look like? How long should small group instruction be taking place? Should it be 15 minutes? Should it be 30 minutes? You know, and, and that's where the alignment and the work that Dana and her team are doing in, uh, in teaching and learning and calibrating those experiences within the classroom are really important. That sounds great. Maybe that just um, it's exciting to get to hear about all of this. It's very nice to meet you guys. Um, I what I think is really good is that um, this is going to bring a unified approach to the whole district, and it's going to make it feel like every student is getting a very similar, and every staff member is getting a similar experience through the district. That I think that's super important. That's they all love, right? Because everybody's going to high school together, um, so we need them to have that similar experience. Um, this just reminds me a lot of authentic leadership and driving. I think everybody is moving towards that kind of authentic leadership um, avenue, really. And, um, and I think that it gets back to preparing our students for, for their futures and what they're seeing. So thank you for all this work and investing in our teachers and investing in the principals. Jay? Yeah, really no questions, just com comments. Thank you. Um, I you know being a few years removed from being a consumer of our our product, I, I just it, you know I was impressed with with the way it was delivered and, and certainly the kids probably took more or less advantage of it and on the particular individual in some instances. Um, one interesting slide to me was the uh, the old methods, new methods the slide that I think Dr. Weiser gave. Presented. I mean, I, you know, I think obviously, obviously the world changes and you know, the world changing global. On the other hand, there are certain fundamentals, you know, that you know do, do, do persevere. And you know, I imagine you know those, those do, do persevere despite maybe some of the slight changes in delivery. And I guess one thing that came to mind that's not really exactly related, but it was how. The way I was taught certain elements of math, like long division, every time my kids were there, they changed it. That was the same <laughs> principles, but somebody changed it. So, what's up with that? You know, I mean, and it's like, and I, I guess it's, you know, I mean, they're both they're the same, but it's like just tackling it a different way. And, and, and it was kind of amusing to me that it sort of boxed out, um, you know, my generation from helping my kids as much as. They might have been helped. And I was pretty good at that. Just quickly, love that grandbaby. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. He's a district resident. So far. <laughs> yeah. Other comments or questions? Benina, one more question. Uh, do you see this? I know you talked a little bit about uh, achievement gap, opportunity gap. So, as you are diving into this work, is it a direct correlation with? Helping to close the achievement gap, or one doesn't have anything to do with the other, or you just use those words. Oh, no, they're absolutely over. That's why I wanted to be able to focus and be able to okay. say it's interconnected to what Dr. Lackner was speaking to. Okay. Because the work is about eliminating those gaps uh -huh. and being able to become focused. And the frameworks when we talk about MTSS and the PLC work and the, the tiers of interventions and the, the intervention supports, it's all really, if it's not aligned, 
you will get random acts of results. And there's random acts of instruction, random acts of results. You'll get what you get because we're perfectly designed to get that. If, we're, if we redesign it and become aligned in our work, the results should change. And that's what we're really trying to do is focus on providing opportunities, increased opportunities for students to be able to access the content. They should have high quality core instruction. And if they need an additional intervention support, we should be able to be calibrated to know exactly what that student needs to provide that for them. And then being able to uh, know that no matter which building you're at, you won't see variability within the system. Zip code should not be a determination of success. Okay, that's a final question. Absolutely. So, so Dr. Lecter, do you see uh, data that will support alignment? Are, are there measurements that says, you know what, we are on track for how we are aligning, how fast we are aligning, or this is just really not working? Yeah, I think that um, as we're learning more about the work with CDL, there are definitely opportunities for collecting additional data. You know, just thinking from student outcome data, I know that we have a lot of opportunities within the classroom to collect data and share the information um, among PLC members and all of those pieces. But I'm sure that Dana and I will be working closely with Nate to really flesh out how do we know that the work that we're doing is making a difference. Definitely. It sounds good because even you see that sometimes you may have to make some shifts and adjustments. Mm -hmm. Here, let me give you an example of when we talk about calibrating and become, becoming hyper focused, laser focused on instruction. So, I'll give an example personally from a building I was in. We looked at the data, we defined that we had specific gaps in achievement with our DL population. So, what did we do? We pulled the building leadership team together, our instructional leadership team. We talked about what are those gaps and what are we going to do about it. It's acknowledging that they exist and then refining their practices. We brought our EL teacher in who worked with every single grade level, and they created instructional strategies for all of those grade levels, and they're going to be different in the same building. And recognizing an instructional strategy you might use in first grade will look different than in fifth grade, and, they, and knowing that kids are at different levels. At the end of the year, uh, we, we had our students, and it off before I even get to the end of the year, we met monthly, and we revisited that topic, and we kept saying, how are we doing? What are we doing? Some months, we were like, we're staying the course, we're continuing to move on what, what we're doing. And our the focus was always to have that check in and always then be able to talk about that data. At the end of the year, after we had taken our MCAs, I received a, an email from the Department of Education saying our EL students were the top 1% of, of growth for all EL students in the state of Minnesota. And I think it shows us where you place the focus in the instructional strategies and that improvement you can see results, but it just needs to be calibrated and we need to talk about it and then not lose sight of it, keep the spotlight shining on it to improve it. Thank you. Yeah. I have one last question. Yes. So during COVID, mm -hmm. um, there was a move kind of to do less testing and I know that universities were requiring um, standardized tests and whatnot. Do you see the move coming back towards standardized testing? I not necessarily. I think that there's uh, an acknowledgement that we need both, that we need the standardized testing. We need that data point that's mm -hmm. objective, data point that's um, comparable across students. But then we also need more uh, of the rich data on student performance and how they're experiencing um, different types of, of learning that they have that isn't captured on the standardized test. So I think that the standardized testing is not going to go away. I think that we're just going to have more emphasis and importance on other types of data and how students show what they're learning and what where's where they're finding success and what they're really good at. So. Well, I was just going to add um, as far as like ACTs and SATs that the University of Minnesota said that they're putting a hold on that until 2025, I believe. Right. And then they're going to sort of look around and see what other universities are going to do. And uh, so for now, one doesn't have that one of those schools. I think I'm accurate. Yeah, yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We were at college, we were at virtual college was it? The numbers of the colleges were saying something that was interesting. Dr. Anderson. There was going to be a couple comments, not necessarily they have to be closure comments, but uh, uh, I took this training a couple of years ago, it's been two, three years ago probably now. Was really impressed with it. I took the principal supervisor academy. Uh, was two of the sessions were 
on site in Washington, D.C., and there were people from all across the country, other superintendents and other district staff that really stood out for me. You know, we all go to a number of professional trainings, and sometimes you learn new things may or may not be helpful. This one really resonated with me. And I thought that it really made sense because I think it brings that continuity and that consistency to the delivery of our products and services that I've talked about before. And uh, it had good alignment. The research behind it seemed really solid and uh, helping to bring forth that consistency across the organization. So that, you know, whether you're at uh, elementary school, A, B, C, or D, or wherever, um, you can, expect predictably high quality instruction, which really is what we ought to deliver regularly. For example, if you go to Youngstead and want a set of tires and say we don't have any here, what kind of a tire store is this? You know, we should have our kids all going to all of our schools and expect that product of high quality instruction. And it doesn't mean that there's no uh, opportunity for creativity and some flexibility, but the standard delivery uh, protocols and expectations, high expectations for each and every one of our students really has to be in place. So that really stood out for me. And then uh, in our search for an associate superintendent, I was quite pleased to see that we had a candidate who had actually done this. And then uh, uh, references spoke very highly of the work that had been done in the buildings where they had been. So uh, that, that stood out for me. And also just in general, um, the uh, peel back to the organizational design. I think that you heard, you know, if you think about it on your way driving home tonight, you can think about, okay, what did I hear about products and services from uh, this presentation or even throughout the, the course of the, the work session today? Um, what did I hear about our customers and who it is that we're trying to serve and the like? Please, and have them uh, be deeply loyal to us, like so many of our students and families are. And then, what did we hear about operations? And you know, sometimes that can be a little less flashy to hear about some of the operations, but equally important because that's what builds the foundation to support all of what you just heard. You know, we talked about budget before. Striking that balance of it being efficient and effective. We don't want to trim so much in any particular area that we lose effectiveness. Um, you also can't necessarily uh, drive every area off the charts uh, to that level of effectiveness that isn't efficient and you can't do it. So, you know, I think we heard a lot of that, that really supports that organizational design model that speaks to our products and services, our customers, and our operations. And kind of going back to that organizational design model. So, thanks to you for I, Dr. Anderson, you have copies of that. Um, Tracy, there's no book. I, I think I might still have my own. I'm thinking of Eddie and, and Melvin for. I, 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 oh, you do already. Yeah. So it is from, our, from, our, from, our, from our MBA classes. Uh, it's a good piece. If I have. Uh, I've never caught it on extra time. <laughs> 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 I've good to great. And, and well, and I think there's some, uh, the board has obviously kept the street data too that we have to make sure so, so we can go through. Well, I just, I just have a, a, a closing comment too, which is really um, thank you to the three of you and for the work. I, I saw this, this presentation tonight really as, a, as an example of Dr. Anderson setting the vision and, and saying very clearly that we want um, each of our students to be thriving today prepared for tomorrow and enjoying the journey along the way. And then your words were then translated in what Dr. Uh, Lackner and Dr. Flansburg said, with also an overlay of how we are emerging back to better and how we are really looking at growing from the last three academic years and two years. And, and what I heard is that we're digging in. And, and that we're digging in um, to our students and that our street data is really looking to understand that experience that our students have had from a very personal level that's very different than what we would have guessed three years ago, right? But yet we're also monitoring our environment and looking at sort of the map level of how our buildings are doing and then the overall level of our district. And, and then I heard Dr. Flansburg, you talking about how we're super digging in to support our teachers, our students, right, and our teachers. 
that's the core of our business. And, and we're leaning in to the classrooms. We're giving supportive feedback and understanding that, that it, there's some intentionality behind that. And then we're doing continuous learning across the system based on the learning that the principals are doing and our SLT is doing. Um, and we're really understanding that it's a new world and it's time to, to dig deeper and go deeper. And so um, I think this work is really exciting. Um, it puts our students at the center, each and every student at the center, and um, and I look forward to, to hearing more about it, and, and we can't wait to see what happens. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And on that, we have concluded our agenda. Um, so the Wiseta Public Schools Board of Education work session for Monday, March 28th, 2022 is adjourned. And have a fantastic and relaxing spring break.